We want to talk about songwriting. We want to talk about what makes a great song. We want to talk about how in the world can we actually get songs to be award-winning songs and also talk about whether or not that even should be the motive. Should we even have that motive to even win awards and all that? So my first question is, um, I guess based on motivation here, what motivates you guys to write the songs that you write? Chelsea. Oh, well, there's a bunch of different motivations uh, depending on kind of that season or what is um, inspiring it. Like sometimes I really need to get something off my chest. Um, there's a psalm that says, unriddle my heart. And uh, David's talking about, um, you know, just solving this riddle, this thing that's on his mind, um, using the harp and the lyre. And so I love that. Um, and then sometimes, sometimes it's just that I have this, like, thing that won't get out of my head. It could be a lyric or a, a melody and I just have to, to get it out. Um, so it's, you know, just kind of having fun with that. Um, yeah, or I guess those are kind of the, like the main ones of like really wrestling with God about something or um, just just having fun, just exploring this thing that's, that's stuck in my head. Are you ever, are you ever, um, thinking of current events, whenever you're thinking of a subject that you're thinking uh, that I could write about that or uh, it'd be nice to, maybe, maybe you're inspired by somebody else's story and that helps you to be creative, creatively bring yourself to a starting, a starting point. Yeah, um, I, I guess I probably, I don't necessarily write about current events in terms of news unless, not that I won't, I just haven't yet, but um, there's, but I am definitely inspired by other people's stories. Um, there's one song that I wrote called Beautiful Mystery, and, um, I had a couple in my mind as a picture of just how they love each other and how that's a picture of how God loves us, um, because the, the husband, and he went for, for surgery, and it didn't go well, and so the wife ended up caring for him. Um, for the rest of his days, um, because he could no longer communicate or care for himself um, after that surgery. And so just seeing her love and care for him um, in that moment was really, um, really inspiring for me and in thinking about, you know, just how much God loves us and how he cares for us in those, in those moments when we're not able to, you know, give back. And so, um, yeah, so definitely I love hearing people's stories and writing about it. Awesome. It's funny, when I listen to your music, Chelsea, I, I, do, he, I do see a thread of stories through them. And I sit there and go, I wonder if this is her testimony. Is this her story? It's like, wow, you know, kind of idea. So, but now, now, you, now that I've been thinking about that, it's like, no, I'm wrong. It's not her story. It's everyone else's story, which is kind of cool. But, but it's awesome that you're able to capture that. And, and put it in, in music because everyone can relate to it or people can relate to each one. Sean and Michael, I'd love to hear from you. What inspires you guys with your music? Because you guys have awesome stuff too. Ah, thank you. Um, I think what, what we, you said something that was kind of interesting earlier about uh, is the motive all about you know, winning or um, charting on the radio charts or you know, becoming number one all the time. And, and for Sean and I, and, and I think we're, we are in accord with this, is it, it's not about really just just the award solely, obviously, it's about um, impacting people. It's about the money. It's about, <laughs> it's about the award, the money, and fame. <laughs> domination. Next question, we nailed it. Nailed it, Sean. <laughs> yeah. that was, that, that, I was getting to that, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, when Sean and I started out, we were, we were very young studying as kids, and for us, it was just passion. We just had a deep love for music and for songwriting at a very young age, and the, I guess the rush for us was that like, even just performing your music in front of a, you know, an, an audience of whether it was 50 people or 80 people at whatever church or cafe when we were kids, that, that was the thrill of it. And uh, people enjoying that, that experience with you as an artist, I think is something that is rewarding in itself. Um, of course, it is such an honor when um, you build some cool accolades and get these beautiful sort of um, acknowledgements from, from whether it's the CGMAs or the Covenants or the Junos, it, it's very moving. And it's very um, humbling for us to be uh, to be a part of that world as well. But that should not be the main reason why you do it. That's not the core of it. It should be your passion, your love, your experiences of life, and sharing your story or other people's stories with other people, right? Mm -hmm. 
I guess I guess songwriting the the fundamental basics of it is just like expression, um, and being in this business for long enough, uh, if you start focusing on radio play or, or kind of um, some of the other success you'd get from responses, um, you, you start compromising a lot of your sound and music and what you're saying. So recently, we kind of um, we stopped writing for radio. We stopped even writing for fans, and we just ignore it as much as we possibly could and just wrote the best songs we could um and and that's it just just write what's on your heart and anything else is just a distraction really and ever since we changed that mindset it's the same mindset you you have when you start getting into music you just you just want to put music out there you don't care about anything else and um once you kind of get back to that mindset all of a sudden like your creative juices just start flowing and things come out of you, and uh, some of our best songs have been written with that mindset. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and world domination. Sorry, we should have <laughs> ended with that. Sorry, Michael. We, we were talking a little bit earlier, but uh, Sean, I want to bring into this as well as as uh, as, as to talking about um, whenever you first started writing. Did you ever think that you would ever um, be at the place you're at now? Um, like. <laughs> Well, back back at the beginning, because most, not most, but right. some of the people that may be listening in right now are at a place where they're beginning, they're just starting up, sure. and they're learning how to do their trade. Um, we were, well, our first concert, um, well, Dill, you would know, a, a venue called the One Way In. Yeah, I remember your band opened for my band, yeah, I remember. Yeah, back in the day, and even, even yeah. before that, we're going back a little bit, there was a band called the Daniel Band, I believe it was our first um, Christian rock concert in the basement of the of a church called One Way In. That was a venue. Vendale Bible Chapel, yeah. That's right. Very good. And uh, Sean and I, I think we were around eight, seven, eight when we had this experience. And I remember just sort of looking at these guys with long hair, ripped jeans, rocking out, being like, that's going to be me one day. And I, <laughs> having that sort of um, inspiration uh, hit us at that age. And I remember yeah. falling in love with it. Um, well, Sean and I falling in love with it at a very early age. And we just, we just wanted to do it. Um, did we think it was going to take us this far? I mean, I think when you're that young, everyone has dreams. I think it's okay to dream. It's okay to push yourself and see how far you can get. But do not, don't have, it's dangerous to expect things. If you expect I'm going to be at this level, I'm going to be number one or a top 10 artist, or I expect a Grammy or I expect a, a Dove or a Juno or what have you. I mean, if you have those self you know relying goals and i think that's a distraction that takes away the the love and the passion the reason why you're performing the art in the first place i started my very first song was about staying in school not quitting school um so good good i, I guess i just uh, i've always i love writing songs that i feel like um are going to make a difference in people's lives and i agree with what the guy said about how like if you're writing a song just for the accolades or for or just for radio i'm <clears throat> sorry just for radio or whatever you are gonna there's gonna be a substance that's lost in that you're gonna lose part of yourself and um so i think it's really important to just kind of go back to that first those those first motivations of what um what got you into songwriting in the first place so that, that you get back to the basics in a sense yeah that's very good uh, now i just want to remind everybody who's logging on right now just to remind you we're at the hub right now we're doing the live tonight we're doing the live stream we've got chelsea amber we've got manic drives very own michael and sean cavello we're doing a really cool time of talking about music writing and so if you have an opportunity to tell your friends and let them know that we're streaming right now. We're going to keep going into the conversation, but thank you for joining us. Cheryl, we'll be also getting some questions from those people online. So people, if you feel like uh, you want to ask a question regarding music writing or anything else about music, please uh, feel free. Absolutely. So let's talk about the day in the life of songwriting, so to speak. Um, what kind of, I guess, what, what happens when, when you hit a song? Like Chelsea, you started by saying you know, sometimes you get a, uh, something that goes into your head and then you just have to kind of go with it. But is there, is there a, a routine, a pattern, a, a method? Is there anything that you, you follow to, to complete a song? Um, I think I'm going to give that annoying answer that every song is different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, don't have, I don't have a formula necessarily, I don't think. Like the other night I woke up 
I, I can't remember. It was like the wee hours of the morning. You know, sometimes when you're kind of waking up, you, I don't know if the guys from Manic Drive have experienced this where you're kind of waking up and then there's a melody in your head from like a dream you've had or something. So I'd like scurry off to not wake up my husband and like go to the bathroom, shut the door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> into my phone um, before I forgot it. That literally happened, I think like two nights ago. So it just, that sometimes it's that, um, sometimes it's a title. Um, there's a songwriter named Jaylene Johnston that I've written with several times. And so there's, there are times where we'll just, we'll start with a title. There'll be something that we're like, man, like just the, this, the meaning behind this title is something that we were really excited to write about. Um, other times it could be just something I'm going through and I'm just writing in my journal and, um, I'll take, I'll take a line from my diary. <laughs> yeah. So it really, it really depends. Um, there have been songs that I've written just, um, there, where it started because I was trying to learn a specific chord on the guitar, like a jazz chord or whatever. And I knew if I didn't write a song that used the chord, I would never act, I wouldn't push myself to learn it. So, so that would sometimes be the, the inspiration of like, all right, let's, let's write a song that, that actually challenges me musically. There is something to be said, just sort of echoing what Chelsea was saying, and the fact there's something with the cloak of darkness at night that all of a sudden there's a wave of creativity that happens. I'm sure right now, as he's, he's probably writing a song right now, yeah. it is, there's something about, I don't know what it is, if it just allows your whole sort of just yourself to be focused on a certain idea. But it's normally at night where the uh, yeah the the creativity starts sort of stirring around in the in the in the brain there. So maybe that's something that's shared commonly among among other songwriters and artists, perhaps. Sean, what say you? Uh, yeah. Right. Um, Are you writing a song right now? Yeah, I, <laughs> literally, I've I've been taking this kind of downtime to to do a lot of songwritings. Um, so I've been kind of locked up in in my basement, just trying to get as much material out, and I'm having a blast. But um, a lot of people think music is um, creative, but I, I'm sure everybody's heard this um, argument before, and I love it because uh, I kind of agree with it. Like, music isn't creative, it's discovered. Um, and as soon as I kind of hit that, all of a sudden, a little bit of my writer's block started to go away, just, just knowing that you just need to kind of find it, and you don't have to make something from scratch. A lot of songwriters go like, how do you just come up with an idea? Um, ideas already kind of exist, they're, they're out there, you just kind of got to discover them, whether that's uh, through meditation or kind of getting in tune yourself or dazing out. Um, but there's, there's about five fundamental ways that I start songwriting. One could be uh, like a basic rhythm and stuff, you know, if you want four on the floor or something like that, um, or a melody line, like you, you get your voice note, your cell phone out, and you do a doo-doo-doo on a cell phone. Um, it could be like an instrument guitar like that you hear in your head or something like that if you're kind of more of a rock pop stuff or it could be the hook or maybe just a theme or a story so those are kind of where i get my my starts from um and just always kind of allow yourself to have access to that um, my brain is constantly just like dazing out and finding out some new ideas and just trying them out and it, it's it's last when you kind of get on a roll with it yeah, That's one awesome. of the uh, techniques that uh, we were um, talking about uh, in previous sessions were about uh, some musicians and artists that do music you enjoy, and you have a chance to uh, maybe unpack and dissect their music and try to duplicate that as, as a kind of a, um, an unseen mentor, someone who doesn't really personally involve themselves in your life, but musically you're very involved in what they're doing. Um, what kind of journeys is any of you to speak uh, uh, to that if there's somebody or something or some artist that's kind of giving you something to look at and think about as you think about what you want to do as your musical identity right that that's like asking us to admit who we rip off i was just listening to the jonas brothers sean i got a song idea <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there, there's so much out there that we could create a large list. And I think it's important to have like a huge catalog of stuff that you're listen, listening to just because um, you can widen your spectrum of um, the sounds and kind of your own twist on things. So my range goes from like Simon and Garfunkel to James Brown um, to some like new metal to some current pop. 
um, which would just be way too much to like list. Um, but yeah, it's just a wide, I think a lot of artists are going to have a really wide variety of what they listen, they listen to. And that's a good point that you mentioned, because one thing that I've noticed about all of your music is that no one can really pin you into one style of music. I mean, your albums have rock, they have pop, they have jazz, they have, you know, country, they have a little bit of everything, which I think is awesome. Um, and, and am I hearing correctly? It's just if, if it's the right mood at the right time, you just kind of got that song and you, and you just do it, you know, to whatever just, style that comes to you. Go for it. Yeah. We're, we're independent too. So we're kind of like, Hey, we like it. Why not? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess, I guess if there's a certain vibe in, in the room. Yeah. I think that that has its play for sure in a songwriting session. I would say so. Yeah. And yeah, there's certainly a, a benefit as a songwriter to not being on a label because then you have the freedom to be able to experiment with uh, more flavors, I guess. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I like my, there's a song that I, that I wrote that's at the end of the album that is a, very jazzy and I was listening to Ella Fitzgerald before I wrote that and then um, for like it depending, depending on the on the instrument, I guess, the, there are different artists that are really inspiring. Like, I love Lauren Daigle's voice, and so vocally, I find her really- Yeah, inspiring. she's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then- She's got a shot. Um, <laughs> Lauren Daigle slash Adele. <laughs> and then, uh, love both of them. Uh, and then, and then uh, when I'm listening to guitar stuff, I really love the bluesy, players like people like um like bonnie Raitt, john mayer uh bb king like i love i love um those like uh those things and then in terms of like the backbeat like a little bit of swagger it could be some alicia keys in there so i love to kind of take from different different styles that's cool because you can kind of mix and match and make your own so to speak right sure and that's yeah. a and and sean and michael i know that you guys started off as the rock guys, right? We started and off as the rock. That's the rock, <laughs> rock guys, yeah. right? And 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 fanny now you pack and everything. <laughs> What's that? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Or when I think of the rock, I think of his fanny pack. That like the gold chain. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now you're you're kind of changing a little bit into the. Yeah, laundry. I think. Uh, well, I can speak for myself. My first love, when being introduced to music, was was rock. It's a good old rock and roll, head banging, sweat, blood, ripped yeah. jeans, plaid shirts, which by the way, I'm, I'm enjoying, we're doing the 90s grunge look, everyone, thank you. <laughs> uh, that was, that, that had a huge impact on me. Just the loud guitars and the banging drums and everything. Uh, still does, I think that's still probably, that's probably my first love. And then from that, it was a journey of, um, my father being very much influenced by a lot of soul and funk. Well, our, our father, by the way, we're, because we're brothers, we have the same dad. Crazy. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of uh, Earth, Wind and Fire, Stevie Wonder, oh, uh, Ray Charles, those influences came up to us. And then uh, randomly 80s pop was more, in you know, our teenagers like Sean loves Michael Jackson. Um, I love the police. So oh. there's a huge whirlwind of just musical influence that have sort of unfolded over the years when we were starting out as Manic Drive. And I think all those artists have had its uh, has its influence on on manic, you know, creating sort of a, I guess, or sort of edge pop, rock and roll, funky sound, you know. Cool. Um, now, if I'm not mistaken, you all play multiple instruments. Is that right? Fifty-seven instruments, to be exact. Yes. Fifty-seven. Fifty-seven. <laughs> uh, all on the keys. Uh, Michael, can you can you list those again? Yes. Yeah, yeah, alphabetical yeah, order. Alphabetical order. That'd be great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I have a little, hold on, it's right here. Hold on. <laughs> so. No, but it is true, actually, it, it, Sean's, Sean, uh, when I first met them, he was the drummer and vocalist of the band. And uh, he's uh, also a very talented keyboardist and, and guitarist as well. Um, and, and Michael has a great voice and plays guitar. And I know that, uh, that Chelsea plays guitar as well as piano. So you, were, you guys are phenomenally talented. I have to say very little piano though. I don't want to, 
I did play triangle in my in my <laughs> the triangle. Now, now you're just playing high jazz band. So if that counts, then I'm also a triangle player. Okay, and I play cowbell, so I'm good. Awesome. <laughs> uh, Sean and I, we were masters of the um, in the fifth grade the recorder. Oh yes. Huh? Oh yeah. We could we could kill it on the recorder. That's on our next album. <laughs> Twenty eight minute solo on the recorder. That is going to inspire every kid now <laughs> that's oh. learning recorder in school. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be fantastic. Awesome. That's it. We're just gonna all have a little junior band. <laughs> Do it. Drums, triangle, cowbell. Uh, maybe I'll get the exile. Oh, I got bongos back here somewhere. Yeah. So. <laughs> I just want to, while we're talking, I just want to let everybody who's just logging on to know that this is the hub. We're live tonight, streaming live from seven till about eight. And we want to thank you guys for logging on. If you have friends out there that you maybe want to get a hold of and tell them, you got to listen in. Um, in tonight's conversation is with Chelsea Amber and Michael and Sean Cavello from Manic Drive. And we are just exploring songwriting together. And uh, it's uh, a lot of fun because both of these, uh, artists, like I say, all three of them are award-winning writers. Uh, Chelsea, you've got uh, three, I believe, Coven Awards. Is that correct? Um, well, I guess three from this past album. Yeah. Oh, right. okay, oh sure. excuse me. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> you got 20 awards. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 You got 20 awards. She's quite amazing yeah. and incredible songwriter. Yeah. Um, Manic Drive has uh, a, a, a few, notably the Juno Award from 2015. We're really proud of them for that. Um, but did you realize that I was just saying that the Juno 2015, you were both there at that Juno Award? Uh, I actually missed the ceremony. I couldn't make it that oh. year. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and I know that, that Chelsea got nominated for a Juno. Yeah, yeah. They, actually, they actually announced Chelsea as the winner but we she didn't show up, so we just took it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're kidding. They're joking. You win. Yeah. <laughs> you didn't take it, so they took it for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, guys, for you taking really it off. You're welcome. Yeah. It's, it's actually on my library shelf right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Okay, now, do we have any questions online coming in? Because I know we have some people watching online. Um, we'll get to that later, if possible. But it'd be nice to get some people to, to, uh, to chirp in and get some questions questions answered um but uh, one thing that what is the most common style of songwriting that you would find whenever it comes to your personal writing is it the words the music um or the story the theme uh, what how does it work for you personally uh, are you talking about the process or uh yeah, just the, the, when you simply when you sit down to write a song, do you sit down to write a song or is it something that you just, oh, I got this riff, I got to play it. And all of a sudden from there you start to write or is it, I got these words, I got to put music to them. How does it work for you? I guess it's yes to both, I guess, depending <laughs> on the song. <laughs> uh, well, for myself, um, personally, it's usually like a musical arrangement followed by some sort of catchy melody and then lyrical content. Um, it's relatively, that's sort of how the pattern go, kind of goes for us. Sometimes it's true that the two worlds will merge harmoniously, which is lovely, but that's great when that happens. Sometimes it doesn't always happen that way. But uh, with Sean and I, we always like to try to find a theme or a topic that almost relates to the music, if that makes any sense. Uh, when we were writing um, Into the Wild specifically on our last album, Sean had came up with this really beautiful sort of um, arrangement that almost had like a, I guess they're like an 80s Lionel Richie meets Sting meets, you know, style, if you guys are familiar with the song. And it almost, at some points, it's kind of kind of tribal. So when we were, lyrically, that, when that, that influenced the idea of going into the wild and then metaphorically into the you know, wild world and braving the world and building, you know, courage and, and, and strength and faith and everything. So that's sort so the of- word, The words kind of help dictate the, the music style. Yeah, like, his his mu musical um, arrangement kind of helped the lyrical content, you know, because he was using some really cool pads and tribal sort of percussions and everything. And I was like, and actually, when we were writing it, it was becoming sort of like, um, yeah, thematic to like wandering in the wilderness, you know, and that's sometimes that happens. The music and lyrical content will conjoin and actually form together. And that's that's actually a great thing that happens. That's probably personally one of my favorite songs I got to co-write with Sean. Um, 
And then sometimes it's sometimes it's strictly emotional. Maybe Sean, you want to talk about your process with writing easier, how that was a very personal song for you. I, uh, yeah, I, I could. Um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, writing easier. Um, the main, so I'm going to dig a little bit deeper because usually when I answer this question, it's kind of the shortened radio kind of version with it. But um, with that song, um, kind of uh, rewinding to the beginning of our conversation, um, I want to kind of go back to why I started doing Christian music, why I wanted um, to just uh, not be distracted by, by the radio and uh, the politics of, of the music and stuff like that. Um, and then kind of leaving myself kind of vulnerable to whatever comes out of myself as expression goes. And so when I started writing the song, I started getting really, really stressed out and really anxious because all of a sudden I was, you're constantly tugging, like what happens if I don't get that radio single? Cause all of a sudden my career that I've worked for like 10 years for could be just like, just taken from underneath you within like six months or something. We, we don't know what's going to go on. And I, I was just so frightened to, to write music from my heart and then so I decided to write a song about it like just how, about how scared I was to kind of just to take that leap and so I wrote a song about how hard it is to write songs that are honest sometimes um and it, it turned out to be a pretty decent song I think it got some radio play which was cool but yeah it was it was a cool thing to to kind of just write from your heart and see people really resonate with it it means so much more when things like that happen yeah, like, well, Sean, you, you previously, a long time ago, you remember the song Memories? It would be um, that kind of thing, too. You had uh, the same type of, I'm going to get back to what really matters. Yeah, I guess so. Man, Memories. That was, how long ago was that, Michael? 2005. Well, technically. That was recorded as One Cross, one, two. Two. Oh, In 03. No, 02. Wow. How old are we? Yeah, I think it was 02. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good to be 22. <laughs> young and hip yeah well we got a question from the audience here um i think sean you started telling us about it but i think the question was what what was the hardest song you've ever written oh man <laughs> I, don't know. Uh, I, I guess uh, emotionally i guess easier was a difficult thing um ever since i've kind of written that and kind of gotten that off my chest um it's been kind of easier. Songs just take me. <laughs> ah, I did it. You did it. You put uh, it on me. You're such an idiot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you have punned yourself. Awesome. Yeah, it's. I'm in writer's mode, so I just the puns happen. Uh, dude, like honestly, we've been writing some songs, and uh, I I keep on rewriting. So this is kind of a a helpful hint to some songwriters. I am so hard on myself as a songwriter that I will rewrite the same song about 10 different times. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like it'll be the same song with a new, complete new lyrics, complete new melody and stuff like that. And I'll take songs and then I'll compare it and then I'll have another song and flip the verse to this song. Um, so a song for me never is like an overnight thing. And if it is an overnight thing, I wake up the next morning being like, how can I do it better? Um, so <laughs> until I can't do it better, there's been a lot of times where I had it right the first time. And after the 10th time, I was like, oh, no, the original's fine. Let's just stick with the original. But I'm always like, it's, it's never done within a day. Um, and I, we don't work with a lot of co-writers and stuff like that. So you need time to digest it, get over the excitement that you just wrote a song and it's the best thing ever. You want to get over it. You want to get sick of it. You want to kind of look back at it and challenge yourself. Just try to beat yourself in, um, in your uh, songwriting. Mm -hmm. And Chelsea, would you be sharing that experience? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I find uh, in terms of just being hard on yourself, I can definitely relate to that because sometimes I'll let my inner critic show up too early um, with that little inner editor and uh, that editor starts, you know, saying, oh, pff, that's stupid don't write that or <laughs> whatever. So I have to, I have to, push that inner editor aside until I'm actually done the song. Cause sometimes I let, I, I let it in through the door way too early. Um, and so to answer the question, the, the song that I've found the hardest to write was, it actually took me 
it took me a few years because I kept coming back to it, but there's a song called Someone's Precious Girl that I released a few years ago. Um, and it, in its initial uh, release, it was called Lovely Child. And then I totally rewrote it and, and re-released it again. But that one I wrestled with for a long time. Um, I think the message was so important to me, not that the others weren't, but this one was especially personal because I had someone in my life that I love very much who attempted suicide and I wanted to write a song for them. And so I was putting a lot of pressure on like, I have to, I have to express exactly what I want to say. And, and it, you know, so there was a lot of weight uh, on it as I was doing it. So that's why I kept, you know, as Sean mentioned, kept going back to the song. That's what I did for that one. So I ended up releasing it twice. Um, the first version is no longer, um, available or for sale anywhere, but this, uh, this, the latest version is. Mm. Is that, that's not on your album, is it Chelsea? No, nope, that was released as a standalone single. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, speaking of, um, of projects, uh, what are you coming up with next? What, what are you working on currently that's going to, when is it coming out? Uh, for, well, for me, I, planning to put out a, a Christmas song. So just wrote one like a couple of weeks ago. So. Well, how wonderful. Well, oh, transition, that's going to be beautiful. Cheryl, let's talk about what's happening with the hub on that note. Yes, actually, like the things that we are doing and one of the projects we have with the hub members is we actually are working on a Christmas compilation and which, and that's the reason why we're even running um, the hub on live. We're, we want to run, um, we want to, encourage our new writers or existing existing writers to just um, come together on a project. We call it Rubber Hits the Road Project because we talk about songwriting. We've done a lot of talking and we want to encourage them to do. So um, we, fi we figured just put this project forward and have them write a Christmas song and we'll put it as a compilation project. I'm reluctant to call it CD. I'm reluctant to call it EP, but it's a project. And, and we're hoping for a lot of people to come up with a creative. I'm even trying to write a song. I'm even trying. So be nice on me. <laughs> I'm probably going to be my own worst critic, guys. <laughs> that's good. I think that's the message we're hearing from a lot of artists, to be your own worst critic, especially when it's coming to the point of making your best work. Um, um, some of the uh, artists that we've spoken to in the past um, off camera are just, they say that they write lots and lots of music for an album. They may write a hundred songs for a 12 song album. And it's just a matter of practicing. It's just, because it, it's an art. It's a form of art you have, like, I like to draw, I like to do painting. And I'm in the same way with music, you know, is the painting finished? Can I put some more highlights? Can I put some more details? Those types of things are the same with music. You want to make sure you've got uh, the right transitions, the right syncopation, the right tempo, the right layering, the right dynamics, all those types of things. It, it's just, yeah. So we're going to be talking about those kind of things. And we were talking um, off mic with, uh, I was talking to Michael uh, a while ago about the other side of the coin in a sense, when you're talking about figuring out what to do with your project in production sense, like Sean, Sean would probably have an understanding of, um, taking a song to a new level just by producing it in a certain way. Right, Sean? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't call myself a producer. I do a lot of the production um, for, for our songs. And I kind of started with that just because studio time was so expensive. And also it was hard to translate like the, the exact sounds you're trying to go for. So I was like, I need a synth sound that sounds like this. And you're trying to describe it. And I was like, no, I'll, I'll just try to play it and record it and send you the file. And they're like, hey, well, we'll keep that. That sounds pretty good. I was like, cool, we, we, we want this kind of tambourine, kind of whatever bells and whistles. And it started, and then all of a sudden, I, I started doing like the bulk of um, the songs. And um, all the, the recording now is kind of done remotely. We're, we're here in Canada. We record everything and then send the stems to um, uh, a producer. It could be Chris Rennell, or right now we're working with... Um, Joelle from from Crutch and um, we just go on the phone and talk about it and um, literally email files back and forth uh, until we get it just right so um, having production knowledge is so crucial for pop artists man it's it's helped me so much it's like another it's like another instrument but it's even better because you could have 80 instruments at once so do it people get a DAW a MIDI keyboard 
and a couple programs and have at it. What's your favorite program? Even though it's, it's going off rail, but it's going to lead to something else. What is your favorite program to use? Oh, as far as songwriting, I wouldn't say this is off rail at all. Like it's so crucial. So kids out there, get your garage band, get a couple plugins and stuff, go on YouTube. There's so much free information. And that's exactly what I do. And all the top guys do it. We still just look at, and it could be an eight year old telling you how to use automation on a plugin. And you're like, what is going on? Get yourself a cheap keyboard and just learn how to fool around with it. And any question you have, there's going to be a thread um, of people that are, that are talking about and figuring this thing out. Um, and you're going to be able to dive into specifics of how you want to craft your, your song. And that's going to influence your lyrics, your melody line. Um, and it's going to allow you just to, to change things up so easy. Um, the program I use is, is Cubase. It's really dated, but you can get any, they call them DAWs, DAWs. They're, they're just audio programmed. Get some plugins. And sign up to, you know, get some samples from Splice. It's 10 bucks a month. You get some killer drum sounds and um, get a couple synths going in there. Learn maybe acoustic guitar, or piano, and stuff like that. You could take this. There's 12 year old kids that are doing amazing thing with a $500 computer. Do it, people. Do it. Yeah. Awesome. There's awesome. also nothing wrong with a classic pen and paper. Great <laughs> program. So this is actually, this is all Sean, Sean and I kind of, uh, cause Dale was asking earlier how we kind of relate. So I'm maybe a little bit more traditional or old school where I am like the pencil and paper and the acoustic guitar guy who comes up with some sort of arrangement or a lyrical concept. And Sean is very much um, plugged in literally to his, uh, his program. He's, a, he's got a great talent of um, adding more maybe texture or layers of instrumentation to which I don't have access to. So. Um, it's almost like a different style of songwriting, but there's also nothing wrong with just being the good old classic pen and paper, guitar player, piano, humming a melody, and even recording it on your phone as an idea and sharing that with, with uh, whether you have a, another writer or a producer that you work with. I mean, that's, that's, that's also a cool thing. At least that's how Sean and I kind of work, you know? And Sean, when, whenever you're producing a song, are you at a point in the song where you say, oh man, this is going to be a hot song? Uh, and, and you're Every saying, song. <laughs> no, but you're thinking this is going to be a single or this is going to be a top, you know, top 10. You know, is there a point where you're at a song and you go, oh, man, I can't wait to finish this? Uh, you know what? Uh, it, you know what? We, we get uh, reality hits this pretty hard enough times that every time I write something, I'm like, I hope so. I will be lucky if this, this gets radio. Um, because, yeah, I, the reality is there's so much good music out there. It's not it's. An amazing time to to be a listener of music because there's just so much out there there's so much content creators um so as as amazing i would like to think i am in my own little world uh i get excited sometimes but unfortunately it doesn't always resonate with um a large population but that's once again going back to where we started write songs from your heart that express yourself and you're never going to be let down you're just going to be like you know what i still think it's a killer song you're going to blast it and have a ball with it. And know what? There's going to be one or two other people that it impacts. And that should be enough. Yeah. So, Chelsea, you were saying you had a single you released. Someone was asking, what was the name of that single again? Oh, Someone Someone's that. Precious Girl. Someone's Precious Girl. Amazing. Yeah. So, when it comes to s releasing a single, what, what would, why would you release a single? Someone's asking, uh, you, re you release the album as opposed to a single. How, how often would you do that? And, and what would, would it would it be a circumstance surrounding that reason? Um, well, for the, for the single Someone's Precious Girl, I think it was just that it kind of stood by itself. Sometimes you can write songs and you're like, and you realize, oh, they would actually make a good collection together. They would, they would make sense kind of on the same project. And then every once in a while you'll, you'll write a song where it doesn't quite fit on, on a particular album. But in this case, this song was really important to me and I really wanted to get it out. So I decided to uh, just put it out there anyway, even though like, I found just production wise, lyrically and production wise, it just uh, didn't quite have the same uh, sound as, as, as an album, as my album. So I decided, you know, just, just put it out. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, I was going to ask another question. Cheryl, do you have one? Um yeah, I, there's one from the audience asking, 
uh, about pitch correction. Uh, do you do you ever have to use that in your in your projects at all, or? No. But, but <laughs> we don't even we don't even use tuners to tune our guitars, people. We are, we are so hardcore. We organic. We are au natural. Yeah, yeah. But if 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 it calls for a pitch corrective, you probably use that as part of an instrumentation, not as a vocalization, right? Um, no, no, no. We we use it for everything nowadays. Um, for production level, unless you're going for an organic sound. Um, and that's intentional where you want to be a few cents short um, of, of the pitch to kind of create that, that tension. But pop music nowadays and stuff like that, I don't care what vocalist you are. There's some vocalists that, that go in the studio and they do a billion takes so they don't have to use auto-tune. You don't have that kind of time. Or if you're looking for the pop style, it's completely polished. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, supermodels are still photoshopped and you're like, why? It's because it, you're never going to be that close to perfection. Well, I'm not Photoshop. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, don't get confused by thinking like auto tune for some reason just erases everything. Um, it sure does help, but you can't completely depend on it, else it's going to sound awkward. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that there is any major, ma any major label, label artist or or song you hear on the radio. Um, I don't know that there'd any be any song you'd hear on the radio that they didn't use a pitch correction at some point on the vocal. It just yeah, everything everything like, is quite polished these days. Yeah, um, Sean, I'm so glad that you um, like going back for a few statements about um, your your uh, strong encouragement to go out there, get the garage bond, get get all the DOWs. Like I'm so glad you said that because um, one of the things that we want to do with, with the hub is we're doing this strain of on songwriting but we also want to do a, a set of of interviews on things like this like the, the basics of doing your own production of music especially now that we're all in kind of social distancing we really can't just all get up and go to a particular studio and and do a recording we're literally on our own having to kind of create it on our own kind of idea so um Thank you for bringing that up because that is something that we want to do. And an audience, if that's something you're interested in, you know, definitely type a message and let us know because we would. Um, that's something that we think we think you need. But if you would like to know more, we can probably get Sean back on to tell us more about that stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And so, and just if you're joining us live on the feed here on Facebook, thank you so much for joining in. Just to remind you, we are doing a live feed till about eight o'clock tonight. We have uh, some amazing panelists. We got Chelsea Amber. Uh, singer-songwriter, uh, award winner, and we also have Manic Drive's very own Michael and Sean Cavello, award-winning uh, writers as well, and uh, we're just having some interesting topics, conversations, having some fun at the same time, talking about songwriting, and uh, maybe even getting a bit to producing as well, and that, that's really good. So thanks for joining us. Yes, I do have another question. Um, we talked about your hardest song, but do you ever have, did you ever have a, a favorite song that you wrote whether or not it got popular, is there a favorite that's kind of close to your heart that you that you were like, yes? I, I, I have one. Manic Drive did "Mom." That was my favorite song. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Come on, that, no, that was, was that one cross. That was a one cross tune, right? That was well, okay, right? Same guy. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that was "Mom," my favorite song. Um, there's been a couple songs where Sean and I, it just kind of clicked, and these are just more like fun, upbeat tunes. But I would say that. It came out pretty naturally, and, and maybe Sean, hopefully you agree with this, but at least for me, Mic Drop and VIP, mm. which actually ironically became no, more notable, and they weren't that thought provoking <laughs> as far as they were just a fun, upbeat, pop rock driven kind of kind of song, and the, the lyrical content's very light. You know, it's just very, it, it's not really in depth or anything, and yet those were the songs that were the most fun to write, and actually had a at the same time a very strong impact on our audience which is funny how that happens sometimes. It just naturally unfolds. You just fun, come up with a fun concept or, or a little saying and that kind of sticks. Um, yeah, that's, that's happened with us a, a few times. So yeah, I would say so, yeah. No, uh, usually I like to give my brother a hard time, but I'm just gonna agree with him then. <laughs> just, just, just one time. Um, yeah, I, dude. 
I, I'm loving the the new stuff that that we get to play. Um, the new stuff that we're writing is is going to be something that that no one else is going to hear on Christian uh, on the Christian radar. It's it's going to be completely current, and uh, we're we're having a blast right again. That's awesome. We're looking forward to hearing all of that. What about you, Chelsea? Is there a song that was a favorite of yours that you've written, whether or not it got popular or recognized? Yeah, um, I remember when I wrote uh, a song called Face the Waves. I was driving in Alberta on the highway and just started kind of singing, had to pull over to the side of the road to to record what is now the chorus. Um, and I remember feeling really excited about that one because I could hear the horns. And I fell in love with big band swing music when I was in middle school, look back when I was playing the triangle in my jazz band. And so <laughs> I just always wanted horns on my album. And so I could hear it. And then we, we did end up putting the horns on the album. We got a marching band to play at the, um, at the release show. So, um, so that was a song that I was like really excited about. How interesting. You, and you named your album the uh, face uh, uh, face the waves as uh or was that the single uh well same yeah the the single it was the title track yeah of the album so this is very interesting you wrote a song that said face the waves that deals with water but you're driving through the prairies yeah explain yeah. that <laughs> Wait, water for days <laughs> i was I was thinking about an experience that I had just the month before where I went whitewater rafting and I was afraid, I was scared out of my mind to go and I even called the place in advance to ask how many people died on your excursion. Oh wow. And they assured me there were none. <laughs> they laughed at me in the, on the phone. Which is probably <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but I um, was thinking about that um, and that situation and how I was able to face the waves and how it reminded me that whenever I focused on what my guide was telling me, my instructor at the front of the boat, when he knew what was coming and when I focused just on what he was telling me to do in that moment instead of what was coming ahead, those big waves ahead, then that's when, that's when I felt calm and could uh, carry, carry on and go forward. So I was thinking about that situation as I was driving down the highway in Alberta and then I started singing dang, dang, and then I started singing the horn part pretty 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 so I yeah, yeah. the side of the road get that on, on my phone just, just <laughs> to echo again what Chelsea's saying Sean does that sort of uh mumbling melody singing beside me when I'm driving we're out on the road or touring or something we'll be in the midwest or something and he'll be doing playing with his hair doing this going <laughs> No, no, no. Um, what, are you, what are you doing? He's like, I just, and he'll shut down the radio and he'll freak out and be like, quiet, quiet. And he'll just, what he's doing right now, he'll be rolling in his chair, you know, and just, Sean, are you okay? Are you singing? <laughs> he's totally thinking of a melody as we're driving. That's great. Awesome. <laughs> so that, that is a thing, I guess, when you're, when you're, when you have a bit of a road trip or a long journey, you end up kind of singing or to yourself. So anyone who lives in the prairies, there's a lot of inspiration out there for you. Yes. <laughs> Drive for eight, ten hours and a song will come to you. <laughs> now, I, always, I always like to ask, if, uh, if, as we are getting close to the end here, is there anything that maybe you wanted to say uh, to someone out there who's maybe uh, at, the, at an onset of their career or in a place where they're just starting to learn to, to, to perform or write or produce? Uh, what's one little nugget or something that maybe a couple of things you could say that you would like to tell them? I can, I, I can go first here. Go for it. Um, obviously there's, there's a lot of talk about the pandemic going on. Use this opportunity to write. You no longer have any excuses not to be writing right now. There's so many people that have dreamt of a time where things could calm down enough that they could express themselves through songwriting, and now we have that opportunity to do it. Take it and um, start crafting it. And literally, there's no right way to start. Just just start going. Even if it's a bad idea, start with it. Do it. Um, and that's going to really take you to, to the next morning where, where you can try it again. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's my number one piece of encouragement. Just, like, do it daily. Like, practice like you're trying to get a six-pack. 
and uh, it's it's gonna happen. Michael, did you like that analogy? Michael's like six pack of beer? No, no. <laughs> we'll be right back. Those are a lot easier to get than, than another six pack. Uh, sorry, I, I was just gonna say um, for people who who sometimes get discouraged or, or frustrated in the songwriting um, world, don't be afraid to suck. But that's yeah. maybe that that makes sense to some people. Does. Yeah, Michael like, does it all the time. <laughs> it's okay. Yes. Have a you got him. When you when you have a kind of a crappy song, cry in the corner for a little bit, have a bag of Doritos, and come back to the session, you know, fresh and improved. But like, don't be like write as if no one's really you know watching or listening because no one is. Write from your heart. Put it on a piece of paper. Record it on a phone, or if you're on a long drive, you know, mumble to yourself. That's fine too. But don't be afraid of not writing a good song that's okay i think that's part of the journey and then something might develop from that as well or yeah. you might go back and have something you could recycle we've done exactly. that we've like had... jacob moon was talking last month and said the exact same thing you might write something the next day you look at it and go what in the world was i thinking yeah. so exactly and it was a six pack that's what, <laughs> that's what happened exactly so, cut back on that little bit and just you know and have fun doing it and just have that passion and love for doing it and i, and I think you'll get somewhere very, Very cool. good advice. Chase, Chelsea, did you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, well, I love the pieces of advice that were already given. Um, one thing I, I would love to add, and this might offend some people, but um, I've found that some, uh, some songwriters who are early on in their songwriting career have a hard time uh, taking in feedback. Um, if it's not a song that it's just meant between like you and God, or, you know, unriddling your heart, so to speak, um, then, then sure, like, just, you know, no need to, <laughs> no need to go back and edit it, just leave it. But if you're, if you are writing a song that you intend to put out there to the masses, um, I think it's important to be open to feedback. Um, I've noticed there are some writers that kind of are like, well, God gave me this song and it can't be changed. And I'm like, well, but did, did God make that typo too? Like we're all, we're, all, we're all human. And so it's always good to just be open. Like sometimes it doesn't mean that that doesn't reflect you as a bad songwriter. Doesn't mean, you know, we all write bad songs. <laughs> um, but um, to be open, because sometimes there's a little idea that someone can add to your song if they're listening to it and they're like hey I, I what if you tried this or hey what if um what if you tried to reword this I'm not sure what you're saying there those little bits of information can be really helpful if you're open to it absolutely I think you, you hit the nail on the head uh there's there's a certain maturity I think to a certain individual if they can take a song and say hmm uh and and listen to somebody who, who's credible. I mean, you don't have to listen to everybody who throws that stuff at you just to be spiteful, but there's individuals in your life you really respect and you understand that what they're going to say is something that's going to add to, not take away from. Um, uh, a friend of ours, uh, Jason, was talking the other day uh, on our last feed, Jason Dunn, was talking about how he went to his pastor, let, them, let him hear the song, and his pastor said, well, let's just talk about theology here. If you did this and this, this would be the... And then, so it just helped him take the song to the better place that it needs to be. Absolutely. I, that, I think all of that advice is really awesome. Um, and, and, and I agree, like Dale, you said this a few times that sometimes as artists, we write a song and it's like our baby is like, oh, don't take away our baby. You know, don't say anything about our baby. Don't hurt it. But yet no one wants to hurt the baby. Like the, people just want to help. People just want to, to help you take that song to the next level. And, and if, we, if we can see it that way or see it, if we, if we look at a song like a baby and think of being in the hospital where nurses and doctors are, um, are, are trained to help take care of the baby, that's what other people are generally like too. So um, I don't think anyone plans to be uh, mean. If they are, well, you know, <laughs> uh, so water you like a duck, you right? Source. You consider your source, absolutely. Yes, consider your source. But definitely uh, if it's people that you revere and trust um 
with anything Sorry. else. I revere and trust them. Like Put the dog in the room, please. I thought that was Sean for a second. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sean, Sean was singing a new melody, I thought. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Catchy. It's good. You got the dogs out? What? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if, if you've tuned in and you're listening in to what's happening, we want to thank you so much at the Hub Online. We're going to try and do this on a regular basis. Um, if you want to check out more of what's happening with the Hub, uh, just check us on Facebook. We have our Instagram. Uh, both of them are there for you to, to, to figure out and to check out. And, uh, you know, it's, we want to be ongoing communication with everybody. Um, and if you want to be part of the Hub, Please, um, what was the email again, Cheryl? Uh, just email uh, Cheryl. Oh, actually, go to our website, uh, gospelmusicindustryhub.com, and go to our contact page and just let us know that you want to be a part of the hub. Let us know your feedback, even about these sessions that we're having online right now, um, because we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're doing this for you, we're doing this to encourage you. And again, I'll go back to what we say. We encourage unity, community, um, mentorship, and talent growth, uh, growth. And what mentorship did we get today from uh, Michael and Sean Cavello and Chelsea Amber? I thank you all very, very much uh, for being here. You are all awesome. Love all your music. And even now, I'm going to say this um, in appreciation for, for um, all these artists, I'd love to tell all the people who are listening to us right now, go to their web pages, go to their uh, YouTube pages, go to their Facebook pages, go to their Instagram pages, tell them that you love them. Tell them you love their music, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Support your artists, people. If you know somebody who knows somebody, let them know about what's going on in these guys' lives. It's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And subscribe and subscribe. By the way, we have a new website, uh, not website. We have we a have new, new channel on YouTube. Uh, YouTube yeah. channel. It's GMI Hub TV that we have um, on, and it's, it's brand spanking new, but we want to encourage you to go there. This particular session is recorded and will be posted there. So feel free to go there, subscribe, and uh, you will see a lot of, you will, you will see a growing list of videos of like this um on that channel yeah we, we posted our last month's interview with jason dunn and jacob moon it's up there now so go check it out for yourself don't forget to subscribe tell your friends about it we got lots more coming i just want to say thank you to chelsea michael and sean you guys are amazing bless you and your ministry at this time of the year uh, this time of the season where we're going through this 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 uh, whole uncertainty we just want to just pray a blessing on you in jesus name amen amen